2021 began with a worldwide ambition to vaccinate as many people as possible against COVID-19. But in many parts of the world, it's been a slow start. There aren't enough vaccine doses available yet, and sometimes logistical problems add to the shortages. That's why the UK decided to simply delay the second vaccine dose to increase capacity. We should prioritize having as many people getting the first dose as possible. And uh, that, that will allow us to get protection to more people more quickly than, uh, than otherwise. Others, including Germany, discuss this option. But there are no clinical trials available supporting this move. What if it goes wrong? What indeed. Hello and welcome to our COVID-19 special. I'm Monica Jones and like many of you, I'm waiting for my turn to get vaccinated. But I don't want to be a guinea pig. So I'm not quite sure what to make of those developments. And in a moment, I'm going to ask a virologist about this. But first, a look at where we're actually at with COVID-19 vaccines. Only a handful of different vaccines have been authorized so far. Some countries have already kicked off vaccination campaigns. Supply remains extremely limited, despite manufacturers ramping up their production capacities. Most of the vaccines require an initial jab and then a booster shot sometime later to provide adequate protection. With a global population of 7.8 billion people, that means that almost 16 billion doses need to be produced for everyone to be vaccinated. Producing that amount will take years, some experts say. But time is of the essence. The longer the virus keeps spreading around the globe, the higher the likelihood of mutation. Just recently, scientists discovered two new variants in the UK and South Africa that appear to be much more contagious. The fear is that those mutations could render even strict lockdown measures useless and eventually even the vaccines. Now experts are trying to find ways to get more shots into more arms. The discussion is focused on three options. The first option is to delay the second dose. That would mean more people could have a first shot, which might provide some protection. The UK and Denmark have approved the measure and are about to put it into practice. But some experts warn that immunity might wane in the weeks following the initial shot. That could create ideal circumstances for the virus to mutate and become resistant. The second idea is to cut the doses in half, which would double the number of people that could be vaccinated. While there are indications that the immune response is the same, experts say we can't know for sure. The third option is to combine two vaccines so that the composition of the booster is different from the initial one. The reasoning behind that idea is that both the AstraZeneca and BioNTech vaccines target the virus's spike protein, but with two different methods. The problem is, none of the proposed alternatives has been tested so far. Now, trust is everything, and for many, getting a brand new vaccine is already a leap of faith. So let's talk more now with uh, Julian Tang. He is Honorary Associate Professor and Clinical Virologist at the University of Leicester. Good to have you with us. Uh, tell me, isn't it a bit risky to change the way we use those vaccines on patients without proper clinical trials to back up those changes as to how the vaccines are administered? OK, so we do have some data on first dose efficacy for both the vaccines, Pfizer-BioNTech and the AstraZeneca vaccine. Although the clinical trials were not designed to test first dose efficacy only, we do see some protection. And we know from other vaccines, our experience with those vaccines is that the first dose actually does most of the work, with the second dose just being a booster. So most people respond to the first dose, and the first dose will induce a sufficient sufficient immunity that can be further boosted by exposure to the virus in the population right. until the second dose is actually ready. 
but but this is not how they were designed. Uh, certainly, BioNTech, uh, Pfizer already mentioned that they they are a bit dubious about extending the period between dose one and dose two. So, how big is the risk that extending the period between the first and the second jab, uh, or reducing the vaccine dose, which is also talked about, that that creates a vaccine resistant strain of the virus? Yeah, so this is a theoretical, theoretical risk because you don't have complete immunity. But this, this vaccine escape mutant can even arise after two doses. So if you suppress replication sufficiently, uh, even with one dose, the risk of that mutant arising is a lot less than if you have no doses at all. So if you immunize half the population with two doses and the other half with nothing, there's also a risk that uh, mutants may arise in that other half where there's no vaccine protection at all. So the risks are relative, and I don't think there'll be any worse with just one dose versus no dose for, you know, half the population, essentially. All right. Well, uh, there are various kinds of vaccines. So before we go on, let's just take a look at, at some of these different kinds, because one uh, is created with uh, deactivated or dead parts of the virus. Uh, another one is called the vector vaccine, and it uses another harmless live virus as a carrier to transport genes from the dangerous virus into cells in the recipient's body. The immune system then detects the offending protein and creates anti antibodies. And then there is, uh, or there are vaccines that use messenger RNA, a part of the genetic viral code. And these vaccines prompt cells in the recipient to produce viral proteins themselves, which in turn then provoke an immune system. So with that, uh, uh, in the back of our mind, Julian Tang uh, from, from the University of Leicester, uh, there is talk about combining different vaccines to make up for shortages or even boost a vaccine's efficacy. Is that safe? Has this been done before? Um, so we've, we've got some experience with the pneumococcal vaccines where we have Prevnar 7, Simflorex 10 and Prevnar 13 uh, mixing and matching some of the doses. Certainly uh, in Singapore, they were doing that without much harm. Uh, if the vaccines target the same antigen, the S protein, whether delivered by mRNA or chimeric adenovirus or even subunit uh, protein uh, vaccines like the flu based vaccine design, uh, I think the, immuni the immunogenicity will be fine. Do, do you feel that people will trust this kind? Because this, this is all going extremely fast, along the fact that we have a vaccine already within a year. Uh, do you think that people will trust uh, all those different combinations? So I think we have to explain to the people and make them understand more about the vaccines to give them that confidence that, in fact, what we're doing is just delivering the same antigen to induce the same immune response with just slightly different carriers. And the carriers shouldn't really make that much difference. The carriers just uh, induce the immune response to react even more uh, against that particular antigen uh, and delivering it in a different way to the body to produce that same immune response to that same antigen to protect, protect you against the same virus. Mm. So if we explain this to people and try and make them understand, they'll be less anxious about it, just, just like with anything. All right. And do we actually know uh, how long our immunity will last once we do get vaccinated? So some of the studies do have long-term follow-ups. I know Moderna has a long-term follow-up for a few hundred days. The AstraZeneca vaccine has follow-up up to 150 days in their phase two clinical trials, showing uh, protection against uh, versus no vaccine versus placebo uh, against wild-type infection for at least you know five months. So we do have some long-term follow-up for that data. Right. And of course, the longer you leave it, the, the longer the immunity, the, the more the immunity will wane. And then that's why the second dose at three months uh, is going to come in. All right, Julian Tang, their honorary associate professor and clinical virologist at the University of Leicester. Thank you so much. Thank you. Now, while most of us can't wait to finally be immune to this virus, speed for 100 days, 150, or maybe up to three months, there are still tons of questions about the safety and efficacy of the vaccines available. And here's one such question you sent to our science correspondent, Derek Williams. Do the vaccines prevent infections entirely, or do they just reduce your symptoms if you catch the virus? Okay, to answer this, we need to go over the basics of how immune response works in a healthy adult. Um, immunologists distinguish between two different aspects of it, um, the innate 
and the adaptive immune responses. Um, you can think of the innate response as, as kind of the body's shock troops. It, its different components react quickly and, and non-specifically to invaders, especially those the body has never encountered before. Um, new pathogens also set an adaptive response in motion as the body learns to home in on the invader, churning out antibodies to flag it up so, so highly specific killer cells can, can recognize and, and dispose of it. Um, the adaptive response, which takes time to kick in, also retains a memory of the invader. Um, that allows the body to respond quickly if it ever encounters the same pathogen again and, and you become immune to it. However, immune is kind of a loose term. It just means that you're resistant to developing the symptoms of a disease again after having it once or being vaccinated for it. But that doesn't necessarily exclude the idea that if you are exposed after that, you could actually carry the virus for a while or maybe even transmit it, just not develop symptoms because your adaptive immune system jumps on it pretty quickly. Um, the real holy grail of vaccine development is what's called sterilizing immunity. That's when a, a very rapid immune response wipes out the invader subsequently so fast that it has practically no time to reproduce. Um, although trials in approved vaccines showed they mostly prevented vaccinated people from, from getting ill, those trials weren't set up to show whether people acquired sterilizing immunity. Until we collect more data on that, even people who receive the vaccine uh, should therefore go on the assumption that even if they are very unlikely to develop symptoms after an exposure, they might still be contagious to others.